Hello, hello. Welcome, welcome, everybody. Um, I'm Jennifer Brennan, and this is a fun, fun webinar, fun lecture to put together. And these are about flowering shrubs, summer flowering shrubs, um, the, the fun ones that aren't hydrangeas, because everyone thinks of hydrangeas when you think about summer flowering. But there are so many other wonderful shrubs that you need to know about. So I'm here to introduce you to um, all, well, not all of them, um, a good portion of them and some of my favorites, some of my favorites. And um, next week, next week, uh, and I can't believe I'm doing this, but it's been really fun. Uh, it, we're we're going to talk about what you should add to your garden for fall color. And uh, when when we were discussing the topic, I, I pointed out that it's not just the trees that have fall color. It's not just the trees and shrubs that have fall color. Perennials have fall color. There are wonderful grasses that have fall color. So I'm going to talk about eight eight to ten of each of those groups of plants uh, of that are my favorite that will add fall color to your garden. But today, don't wanna confuse anybody if you're just signing in. Um, today is um, um, on uh, summer flowering shrubs. And I, I got to start the day out at the farm truck. Boy, I, I don't want you to leave uh, my, my webinar, but um, we got um, tree hydrangeas in. And um, um, Pinky Winky is one of them. And those are the standard ones. And then we got Bobo. We got mature size Bobo hydrangea in. And they're, sold, they're being sold at a, at a value of a discount, uh, 120 for a tree um, um, pinky winky hydrangea, uh, usually $200. And then the, um, the, the Bobos are, instead of 150, they're 90. And, and they're mature size. So pretty good values and some really excellent um, heavy metal panicum, prairie switchgrass, heavy metal, um, Coryopsis moonbeam, uh, calamaris, the blue star perennial, um, and little Susie, um, the Viet um, cultivar of Rudbeckia. And um, I was just out there working with them. Oh, oh dear Villa. Deer Villa, a black Kodiak or Kodiak Black. So um, really good values. And the value price is until noon. So you can watch this webinar and leave at 11 and come and still get a, a good deal. There were only two of the small Japanese maples left. Uh, so they, they were the ones that were going the fastest. And, um, and, and, and but, um, but you probably won't find a Japanese maple when you get there, but all the others are really good. So, so and we're about a minute away from starting. Um, I've got 12 people, welcome, welcome. And uh, I, I was a bad girl, I was a bad girl. I attended a seminar um, every afternoon, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday for the Perennial Plant Association. And gosh, it was sad. We usually had, a, we always have a, a seminar where we all would go out of town and be gone, you know, for a week. And we, we had to do it virtually. And, uh, but boy, did I see some great speakers did i hear some great topics gave me some ideas for some great lectures to share with you and um and and boy i was totally inspired isn't that nice that that's where you do those things you become totally inspired so i'm inspired so hopefully i'll i'll, I'll help you all be inspired we're at 9 59 right now so and it looks like i've got um, 16 people welcome welcome so and oh 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 i was talking about being a bad girl because I did the webinar, I didn't get my hand out. I didn't get my plant list compiled until late last evening. And so Carly sent it under a separate cover uh, today. And it's just a list of the plants with the opening notes. So, so I'm gonna be giving you all those details as we go through all, you know, all of it. But, and I made it easy. It's just, it's just a two pager. So front and back, is that cool? So, okay, it is. Um, 10 o'clock. So now here's the official introduction. Uh, welcome everyone to Shelley's Virtual Learning Center. I'm Jennifer Brennan. Uh, I'm the horticulture information specialist here at Chalet. You usually see me out in the plant information office 
out in the nursery selling plants or uh, at the microscope looking at all the fun samples that I get to to, to look at. So uh, so but then you also see me here um, on camera and doing you know doing the webinars. Oh, I've got to do this. I almost forgot. I have to I'm going to share my screen now. We have 23 people. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, this lecture is summer flowering shrubs besides hydrangeas. Okay. Um, all right, and, and, and we, we, if you missed it, uh, I did the hydrangea lecture this summer. Tony Fulmer had to be out of town. And, and so I stepped in and, and um, I did, a, I did a, cute, a few little changes uh, and uh, updates, but um, you can go uh, to YouTube and all of our virtual learning programs are available on YouTube now. So you go to YouTube and then just type in chalet, virtual learning or chalet and um, virtual hydrangea or virtual repotting orchids or virtual flowering shrubs, you know, so, so, um, so then you can watch them anytime at your leisure. Okay, so here we go. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Here you go. And I love my opening shot. <clears throat> I'm going to go from the beginning. Here we go, everybody. Very good. Oh, I forgot to mention, um, I'm going to do the presentation first, going over all the materials and the, and, the, and the slides. And then I will stay as long as necessary to answer your questions. And if you enter them in the, the Q&A column rather than the chat, it helps me keep track of them better. So you know, any questions, I'll be glad to answer as we're, as we're going along. Um, now, this gorgeous, this is actually a dieback shrub here in Chicago, but we treat it like a shrub. And um, this, is, this is the hardy hibiscus. It's hibiscus moschutos. And I'm going to talk more about it when we get to the axle section, but I just had to introduce you to this. And um, um, this one is, um, oh my gosh, I'm just blanking on the name, Jenny. Um, oh, Midnight Marvel. Midnight Marvel. And look at those, the, these flowers on these shrubs are almost 12 inches in diameter. So when you, you know, if you measure your hand from here to there, most women's hands are six inches. And so you put them together, that means up to next to my face, that flower could cover my face. It's incredible. And then with that burgundy foliage, and then this is a group of um, hibiscus, the hardy hibiscus that are being hybridized um, uh, over at Walters Gardens, which is the wholesale gardens over in Michigan. And Hans, uh, Hans Hansen is the hybridizer of this. And what is so cool about theirs is he is selected for blooming all the way up and down the stems, not just at the very tips. So you get this packed full display of these gorgeous, huge flowers. So I'll go into more on this in just a minute. Now, don't sweat summer planting. As hot as we've been and as dry as we've been, a lot of people might be concerned, you know, and worried about planting anything new in their garden. And, and granted, summer can be a real, you know, tricky time of year, you know, with these soaring temperatures we've been experienced and the oppressive humidity, and then also the lack of rain. You know, most of us gardeners understand that, you know, can, can understandably be fearful to make any sort of investment, you know, in, in, in the garden. But, um, but if you follow the rules that I'm gonna tell you right now and my nuggets of wisdom um, you know, for planting in um, the, the hottest season of the year, you'll have good luck. Now, almost all plants are happier in the ground rather than they are in a container. Um, and the, the soil is, you know, the soil in the ground and being planted in the soil in the ground is a lot nicer environment um, for our plant than the hot nursery, the, the nursery lot, or on your driveway waiting to be planted. But with those black containers, it really heats up with the sun shining on it and the ambient temperatures like we've been having last week. Today is lovely though, isn't it? Oh, today is absolutely lovely. But this past week was just horrendous with you know temperatures in, in, in the upper 80s, low 90s, and then the high, high humidity to go with it. That the office that I work in, that um, the Plant Formation Center, 
it, 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 it was running 98 degrees. Oh God, it's just outrageous. But, um, but, but if you have the plant in the ground, um, the temperature is usually 10 degrees cooler, oftentimes 20 degrees cooler in the ground. Um, and so, so, you know, it's actually much, much better to, to, you know, to go ahead and plant them, but only if you can keep them watered, you know, make sure that you can keep them watered. You know, if you're going to be going away for a two week vacation, don't buy it and don't plant it because unless you have someone that'll water for you, you'll come back to dead plants and that's not good. Now, I like to encourage people to follow that quote unquote, the four quadrant count to five rule. So you divide the ripple into quadrants and hold a watering wand, a long handle watering wand so that the nozzles just above the, you know, the soil level and then let the water run and counting to five. One, two, three, four, five. And then move the quadrant, or move it to quadrant two, count to five, quadrant three and quadrant four, counting to five in each place. And then do that three times in a row. You will make sure that you have watered and completely saturated the root ball all the way from the top of it down to the bottom of it. And that will keep your plants very, very happy. Now, my rule is that, you know, I never put a spade in the ground, especially in summer, without adding, you know, a, you know, a, a good healthy percentage of compost. And whether it's leaf mulch, chalet compost, uh, cotton burr compost, um, you add compost because especially in our heavy clay soil, um, and so whether you're planting something or removing something, always take time to feed the soil with organic matter. And that's that's any kind of a compost. And the, the amended soil is going to erode less. It's going to hold water more. It's going to hold air better because it's going to create air pockets in that soil. And it's, it's going to generally you know, grow more vigorous plants. OK, now we're ready for this, the, 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 the plant list. And here's and this is this is Escos parviflora or bottle brush buckeye. I have one of these in my backyard, and it's been there for over 25 years. And it is 12 feet wide. It is this year. It is um, an eight to 10 feet tall, and it just it just it just looked like this last week. With as hot as it was, it finished flowering really quickly. I was really nervous about all the Japanese beetles because the Japanese beetles love this. But um, here's what it looks like when it's not in flower. Beautiful, substantial shrub. This is one plant. This is one plant. Okay. And then this is a close up of the bottle brush flowers. And then this is what it looks like when it's going into fall color. It gets a gorgeous yellow fall color. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. And then um, it's actually, you know, it's in the, it's in the Aeschylus, or the, the Buckeye family. And this is Parviflora. It, it, it's actually native to the rich woodland areas of Alabama, Georgia, and Northern Florida. Uh, it's this really dense, 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 de deciduous, very mounded and suckering. It suckers. So new shoots, you know, spread adjacent to the plant every year. It's multi-stemmed. And it typically grows six, six to twelve feet tall, and um, and and you know, and also equally as wide, you know, so twelve feet wide, and it, it has these beautiful large palmate leaves that are green, green, green. Each of them has three to five leaflets. Now the erect and showy cylindrical flower panicles are beautiful, and they have the tubular white flowers, uh, you know, stationed all up and down, you know, that panicle. They have conspicuous red anthers and uh, pinkish elements and that really make it look spectacular in you know in, in mid 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 summer um, they actually form a glossy uh, kind of inedible um, pear-shaped nut they look like buckeyes you know that are that are encased in husks and um and you know you know and up here you rarely see the buckeyes, you know, on, on this plant. It's more down south. You can get them in on the plants in um, in Ohio, though. You know, they do have them in Ohio. Okay, um, so, so uh, and then again, I, I showed you a photo how the fall color is yellow, beautiful yellow. Now, this is a cousin to um, to the, the regular, and this is a, a, a variety called um, Seratina, 
and it's 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 Rogers, you know, it's which is native. It's native. I'm going to move. I have to move something on my screen here. It's native to um, Alabama, and, and it differs from the species because it's a larger plant. This one actually can get 20 feet tall and it produces um, much longer um, flower inflorescences. These can be as long as 30 inches. So it is a beautiful, beautiful plant. The cool thing is it blooms later than, than, um, than Aeschylus parviflora. So this is about three weeks later. So I like to, I like to encourage people to have both in their garden. So it extends that bloom period of, you know, for those plants. Okay, why isn't, oh, here I have my slide here. Now, buddleias. This is butterfly bush. Here in, in our area, our gardening area, the butterfly bush is considered a dieback shrub. So it doesn't stay up over, you know, over winter. If we get good snow cover, sometimes you'll get um, eight to 12 inches of the previous year's stems that the new growth will, will come off of. But most of the time it just comes back from from um, you know perennial sh um, roots in the ground, and so the, some of the th my three favorites are black knight, white profusion, and then pink delight. And butterflies and pollinators love this plant, and um, it's you know you, you I, I a lot of people um, and it looks similar to a, a summer flowering lilac, but um, you know and, and, it, and this these come in purples lavenders, blues, pinks, and white. And they, they're very, very fragrant. Um, and they, they will bloom all the way from midsummer, the end of June to autumn, until honestly, until they, they, they hit a, a hard freeze in September, October. And you know, so what's interesting is they start to fade um, you want to deadhead the flowers. And you like in this photo also, you can see the new flower buds that are below the, the full flower. Those just keep being produced all through the growing season. So you can tidy it up. Uh, it, this is one of those plants that you don't have to deadhead to keep it in bloom. But if you tidy it up when those the, the bigger flowers are spent, it really does it justice. It likes full sun in moist, well-drained soil. Uh, and again, these can go... The different varieties, usually they can go between eight and 10 feet tall and they're hardy to zone um, um, five and, 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 and deep as nine. This one is called Miss Molly, the, the, the color of this, this one. And this is Miss Molly also. Uh, this is actually up at the Chicago Botanic Garden. I took this photo up there, it's really pretty. And then, and then this is the white, this is the, the white one. And then a good example of butterflies on it. Uh, and then, Again, it, it can grow wild in many climates and can be a little bit invasive. So it, it doesn't, it can kind of have a bad reputation, but it is absolutely the queen of summers, uh, butterfly and, and hummingbirds. Uh, and again, uh, the, the flowers, white, blue, pink, purple, um, red, and even yellow. And, and again, zones five to five to 10. This is a different, um, a different cultivar called Lockinch, Lock Lock it's one of the most heat and drought tolerant um, butterfly bushes, very, very fragrant. And it is, has to be in full sun to get the best show. And again, hardy zones five to 10. Now purple beauty bush, Calicarpa uh, dichotoma is fun. I, we always point this, we always show photos of this. This is actually the fruit rather than the flower, but because you know it it it, it blooms in the end of June in July, then the flower the, the fruit forms and the berries form. Uh, you know this is what makes it most showy. And look how the berries just you know run parallel up and down this you know the, each of the each of the branches, and so it makes it just gorgeous. It, it looks like it looks like purple bubble gum on a plant. Now it, it's really eye-catching. They get to be about four to eight feet tall. It's a multi-stem shrub, very arching. You know, it's a very arching shrub, and 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 it, it has pale green foliage that emerges in the spring. And then you get those. It, there's lavender pink flowers in June and July. They're not as showy as the fruit is, but it, it, it is fun to see them. I can't believe I don't put a, I didn't put a picture in. Okay, by autumn the flowers mature into masses of violet to magenta berry-like fruit clusters. And then they encircle the stem 
and um, and they contrast really nicely with that the, the pale green foliage. Uh, they like full sun, dry locations. You know, if you can give um, acidic, make the cell a little more acidic, they'll 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 you'll get better fruiting with that. So holly tones a really good one to use. You know, on on it, and um, and 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 then you can also put it in part sun, part shade. It, it performs just as well in, in that. And it's really best used in mass plantings, you know, in, in, in the garden. And then here's a, another shot. Look at that. I mean, it just looks like clusters of, of grape bubble gum. And then, and then from a distance, it's really fun with that, those limey green kind of leaves and the purple, really nice contrast. This is the Japanese beauty bush. And this is the Calicarpa japonica and it, very similar, similar to the same habit but it has white berries. So if you want that little different look, you know, go with, you know, add this one. And now this is Carolina allspice or Calicanthus floridus. And um, it's really underused. It's really under underused. And it has these beautiful deep red flowers and, and the flowers are there from late spring into midsummer. So it just keeps reblooming. And um, th 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 some people say they're not showy, but I think th it's more of a masculine flowering shrub because um, the flowers are, are darker in color and, um, and, and, and they're almost, they almost look like dried flowers on the, you know, on the, uh, on the plant. Uh, this one is native to North America, which is really neat. And this is just a really tough, 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 low care plant. It likes full sun to part shade in moist, well-drained soils. It gets to be eight feet tall and it's hardy to zone five, five through, five through nine. Now, bluebeard or Caryopteris, it's clandonensis. Uh, it, it has these airy clusters, clusters of these beautiful blue flowers. And, and that's what gives it its name. It, if you look at the flower upside down, it looks like a beard. It looks like a beard. And um, the flowers appear later in, in the summer, when many of the other shrubs and, and perennials are not, you know, not, not blooming, it's easy to grow and it takes all, uh, all problems except the very worst heat and the very worst drought. This year's testing it, this year's really testing it. So if you have it in your garden and you haven't been watering it well, start watering it well in order for it to form all its flowers. And um, I mean, every pollinator out there loves this plant and including hummingbirds. So um, it makes a great cut flower as well. And it likes, again, full sun <clears throat> in moist, well-drained soil. The plants get to be about four feet tall and covered in flowers. And uh, it, it, it zones five, five through nine. And when I say this is a dieback shrub, it usually dies back to the ground. You prune back the dead wood and then it grows from um, the dormant rootstock over and over and over. So beautiful, beautiful plant. This is what it looks, this is a, a full kind of full shot of it. Excuse me, I got a drink. This is, it has really nice. Oh, I love button bush. Button bush, this is actually a plant that was favored by uh, the first peoples, Native Americans here in, um, in, 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 in the Midwest. And it's Cephalanthus occidentalis. This is a shade loving shrub that is native to the southeastern rivers and creek banks. And it, it loves moist soil. And you have these incredible pin cushiony, ping ball, ping ball shaped flowers. No other plant has this. They're lightly fragrant, very attractive to wildlife. It likes part sun or shade, you know, or, or full shade, hardy to zone five and seven. There's a cousin. This is this is the Chinese button bush. Uh, is this is the genus Adina rubella, and it's only hardy to zone six. So, but I wanted to show you so you don't get confused, you know, out, out like in in a, in a nursery or garden center, and and it, it's closely related to Cephalanthus occidentalis, um, and but not as hardy, and it's grown primarily for the small glossy leaves. And the nice, this nice cup of early to midsummer Sputnik like flowers. It has a finer texture foliage and stays smaller and more compact, you know, than, 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 than the native, the native one. So uh, the, the little creamy white balls last for several weeks. 
uh, before yielding to as a small brown fruit, there's small brown fruit clusters. And uh, it's very, very tolerant of dry shade, which is so nice. And there's there, what's cool about it, there's not a single insect or disease that bothers this plant. I love saying that, I love saying that. Now, Clethra, Clethra is one of my favorite shrubs and there's different cultivars, Pink Spire, Rosia, Hummingbird. Uh, and there's two more I, I didn't have on the list here. It tends to be more of an upright than wide shrub, uh, tolerates shade, does even better in the sun, but tolerates shade. That's what's so incredible. And then doesn't mind our heavy clay soil. I love this plant. I absolutely love this plant. And there's wonderful cultivars. This is Pink Spires. And so in shady spots, the summer sweets really are fun because when they do go into bloom, those, those bright flowers really lighten up a shady, shady spot. And then they also have this, the reason it's called summer sweet because it has a really nice fragrance to it. It's sweet, it's sweet to smell. And then, the, and I can't believe, I don't think I have a picture of it. The fall color is golden yellow. yellow. It's almost canary yellow and incredible. Ruby spice, and that's what this picture is right here. Um, they, they actually have an extra long season of bloom, which is, so instead of being in bloom for just two weeks, they're in bloom for a good solid three months. So uh, this one gets to be five feet tall and it's hardy to zone three, really neat. Minneapolis here, this is straight species with the white. Oh, come on, plant, there we go. This is pink spires and look how heavy they are. I mean, it's just flowers all over, even coming from the center of the plant on, 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 on smaller branches that are down in the center canopy. And this, and this is Ruby Spice. You can see it has the darker, darker, darker pink in bud. And when it opens up, it's a little lighter, but still, you know, still, still the darkest colored one. Smokebush. Smokebush. The, the, the Smokebush is really fun because you, you grow it for the flowers and, and not, you know, not, not the size. And you get these large masses, masses of small flowers covered with billowy hairs that turn smoky pink or, or purplish pink. And some of the leaves have burgundy foliage and you wanna plant this in full sun. It's hardy to zone five and zone eight, or to zone eight. And then you can see the different colors. There's the burgundy one on, on, on the right. I believe that's royal purple. And then golden spirit is the, is the golden one that's just over to the right of, of, um, of royal purple. And they make just lovely contrast in, you know, out in the garden. And then here it is uh, grown as a standard tree form with, you know, with, you know, the canopy uh, upright. And that's what it looks like when it's in, in flower. Close up of the flower, you see those fine hairs, and then they turn that pink color. And then this is the, um, the golden spirit is the name of this one. And then the, the photo down below uh, to the right is the fall color. And you've got that beautiful yellow and then, and then the, red, the red colors. And since I'm trying to not have um, someone attack me on, uh, you know, uh, on, on a webinar, um, I'm, I'm loving this fall color one because, you know, it, it's just, it's gorgeous. Okay, this is a close up of one of the burgundy foliage ones to show you that, you know, the, the great color, the, the, the great color. And you can harvest, and here it is, here it is larger. And I'm, I'm, I'm showing the new tip growth and you can see the new, the new foliage coming in, growing out and above um, the, um, the flower panicles. Okay. Oh, and then this is what that same plant looks like in fall color. So it, the, the chlorophyll dies out and then the fun bright, bright red of the fall color of, of this shrub is showing up. Now, this is a fun one. I love, this is seven sunflower. This plant didn't exist until the late 1990s and someone found it over in, in China and brought it back. 
Is that amazing that a, a new plant, totally new plant could be found? It has a real interesting flowering um, pattern. The white parts are the flowers and it blooms late, it blooms late. So the one on our fence line, out uh, on it's on the Lake Street side of our parking lot. It's just budding up right now, but the flowers haven't opened. So when I say it's a really late bloomer, it's, you know, it blooms the very end of July going into August. And then when the blooms finish, you get these beautiful red bracts that stay on the plant all the way into the winter time. And then they fall off next spring when the new growth starts growing. But the foliage is beautiful. It's of a strap shape, dark, dark green leaf with this very distinctive parallel um, venation pattern. And it, it also gets beautiful, beautiful exfoliating bark. I didn't show the bark because I was just focusing on the flowers and things. Now we've come, well, I'm going to go back and just show you this again. There, there it is. That's a baby one. Um, most of these turn into small trees. Uh, and, um, and, and then, you know, you went into that horticultural is it really a tree or just a large shrub? Technically, it's considered a large shrub, so it's usually always multi-stemmed, um, unless unless they unless they limit up. But um, but but it, this is a it's a fun fun plant, and so and again just rediscovered in China in the late uh, '90s, and then reintroduced here uh, to the United States, and everyone loves it. I mean, everyone absolutely loves it especially when you get those bracts on it. Now, the, the, the hardy hibiscus, man, I love this plant. I just think this is, I mean, it's, it's not timid at all. It just, it, it just knocks your socks off. And it's, a, it's just a real eye catcher in the garden. Uh, it does like a lot of water. It does prefer full sun. And um, so it's the, it's the hibiscus mushrutos. Midnight Marble is the one over on the left with the bright red flowers. Starry Night, that was the that was the that was the big buzz. I think that was introduced two years ago. Maybe it was four years ago now. But it, it's, it's, this one has the darkest foliage. You can see how dark, dark, dark burgundy that foliage is. And then to have those beautiful flowers, those pink flowers with with the darker um, you know um, markings in the center. Incredible. And then Berry Awesome. Berry Awesome has been around, I think it's been around for like 10 or 15 years. That was one of the first introductions from, um, from Hans Hansen, uh, from his hybridization work. And, and But all of these bloom up and down the stems. Um, some of the, uh, the original ones, uh, they only bloomed at the very tips of the branches, you know, when, where the stems. And so they, they were gorgeous. But these are so much better because you just look at it and there's flowers everywhere. And it, and it just seems like it blooms forever and ever and ever. Okay. Oh, back. I, I didn't have the information. Um, this again, full sun. And a lot of these will stop at, um, at well, very awesome, which was only a four and a half footer. Um, the Midnight Marvel can go up to six feet and Starry Night can also go up to six feet with an equal spread. So I mean substantial, and this dies back to the ground every year and, and grows that much each growing season. Incredible, incredible. Okay, uh, Rosa Sharon. Um, I grew up, my grandmother has uh, had Rosa Sharon's all over her gardens and she's she, she, she taught me some of the value of the herb. It was one of the first plants I had fun with in the garden. I learned how to make um, dancing dolls with rows of Sharon flowers. And you would take buds and, and clip them off the plant and that would be the head of the doll. And then take an open flower and then use toothpicks and you would put a toothpick in the bud, positioning so the, the calyx with the stem looked like a little cap on top of the uh, on top of the head and then um and then you would have a a, 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 a a toothpick and stick that on the dancing lady's dress and and with the open flower would be laying kind of down on top of the tabletop or we always did it out on the lawn and then you would take two toothpicks and stick them in the top 
calyx of the open flower. And those were the arms of, of, of the dancing lady. And so it's really fun. If you have kids in your life, it's fun to do this too. And so Rose of Sharon, it's also a hibiscus, but this is Syriacus. And, and, and it flowers in gardens. I mean, from coast to coast, north to south, everybody loves Rose of Sharon. And you want to plant it in full sun. You can get by with part shade. It's hardy to zone, um, to zones five, and then all the way down to 10. Um, you can really rely on Rosa Sharon. To, it just provides tons of color, you know, during the hottest months of the year. It goes into flower at the end of June, peak season, July, all the way until it freezes at the end of the, at the, end of the season. And you have these tropical looking blooms. They're not as big as the tropical ones, but and, and, and the hardy, the hardy ones, but they're, they're just, they, they cover the shrub and um, what you want to look for, um, look for the sterile varieties as, such as Minerva. And because a lot of times, if you have a non-sterile, it'll make seeds and it drops seeds everywhere. And you'll have Rosa Sharon seedlings throughout the lawn and all your garden beds. So look for, look for the sterile ones. They love to have full sun. Uh, in, um, you know, um, in dry to moist, well-drained soil. Uh, they can get to be 10 feet tall and 10 feet wide, hardy to zone five. And then here's some of the cultivars. Um, Bali, blue chiffon is the one that's in the upper um, uh, left-hand corner. Blushing bride is um, the one down in the bottom. That's the double one. Then there's uh, lavender chiffon. And little Kim, sugar tip, Tahiti, white chiffon. And you can also, um, you get multi stem shrubs, you can also limb them up. So it's a tree form with an upright canopy, but just, just gorgeous, just absolutely beautiful plants. And just some more close ups right here. I love this one. That is, this is, I believe, Minerva. Now, Hypericum or St. John's wort. And this is one called Hidcoat. And it's that beautiful, beautiful, beautiful um, yellow, kind of a pom-pom flower with, with, with the petals hanging off the back of it. And um, excellent, full sun to part shade and just covered, covered, covered with flowers this time of year. And this is one of those plants that does this anywhere, any, you know, and, and all, you know, all summer long, whether it's hot and dry or too, too excessively rainy. Um, you, you can tell when you see these potent or saint foil is the is the common name of this. Oh no, this is St. John's Word. Excuse me, this is St. John's Word. When you see these in um, the 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 parking lot plantings of places like um, Chick Fil A, you know how easy they are. And so don't discount them. Just realize that you've got a really trustworthy plant that will do well. And oh, I thought I had a white flowered one in here too. I don't. Uh, now, Physocarpus or nine bark um, are, are, you know, are wonderful. Oh my gosh, I just forgot what cultivar this is. Oh, this is summer wine. This is summer wine. And, um, and you know, it, it's an upright, arching, spreading, um, kind of coarse, deciduous shrub. It's, it's actually native to Missouri. And, and it is closely related to the Spirea family. Uh, and it, it typically grows along streams, rocky banks, and gravel bars, and, and in moist thickets all along um, the, the counties in the south of Missouri, especially along the Missouri River, or south of the Missouri River. Uh, they grow to be five to nine feet tall. Diablo is a real um, famous uh, dark-leaved cultivar. Noted, it's noted for its exfoliating bark. On the mature the mature branches, that's where the name comes from. You know, it peels and strips to reveal, reveal several layers of reddish to light brown um, inner bark, and that's where the name nine bark comes from because there's it looks like there's nine layers of bark. Did you know that? Ooh, a good trivia question. Okay, and then when it's not it, it, when it doesn't have leaves on it, it provides really excellent winter interest. Um, but usually during the growing season, it's hidden by the foliage, so you don't get to see that. And um, it has these beautiful um, small pink or white flowers. They're five petal flowers. And it, 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 it appears in these dense, flat, rounded, um, one to two inch diameter spirea like clusters. They're called corums. And, um, and they, they start late spring 
but going to the early summer months. And so that's why it got into the summer flowering shrub things. And then it actually gives way to drooping clusters of reddish fruit and they're called inflated seed capsules. And, um, and, and then the leaves are, the, 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 the leaves are usually a dull green and then you know changing to kind of an undistinguished yellow in the fall. But the, they, they, there's so many cultivars out there with the different colored foliage, Diablo, or this is called summer wine. Okay, so Potentia um, fruticosa or sink foil, it's grown for, it has either cheery yellow, orange, red, or white flowers. And it's one of the most common and easiest um, flowering summer shrubs to grow. And uh, it, it, it's not picky about its soil. It can tolerate drought really well. So that's why it's good in parking lot plantings. Uh, you do need to get it established before you expose it to any drought. Uh, but um, but it, it, they just are, you know, nonstop bloomers and just really put on a good, good show. It needs full sun, dry to moist soil. It um, only gets to be three feet tall and three to four feet wide. And it's hard in his own three. So and this is this one's called Gold Drop. And um, Sank Foil is the common name. Um, this one is Abbott's Wood, which is the white one. And actually, when I was getting my lunch at Chick-fil-A this morning, uh, their their parking lot is 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 planted uh, with Abbott's wood with the white one. And I didn't, I had done this lecture and I didn't, I had never noticed that it was Abbott's wood when I drive through the drive-thru all the times I go there. So, you know, amazing what you learn, huh? Okay, and then this is this is the um, the yellow one again. And you can see the size mounding, you know, at, at three feet tall. And then another, this is coronation gold. Oh, and there's Abbott's wood again. I went overboard, didn't I? Now, staghorn sumacs, I love staghorn sumacs. And um, this is native, this is actually native to Northwest Arkansas, where my dad, um, my dad's house is. And so they like it, they like it. I love how they describe them high and dry. They can sit up on the top, top ridge of, you know, a high elevation and, you know, and, and survive really nicely. Um, I, I love it. This is a Rus you know, Typhina. Uh, it's called staghorn sumac. It's the largest of the North American sumacs, and it's native to woodland edges, roadsides. It, it grows um, on uh, in railroad embankments and streams and swamp margins, all the way from Quebec, you know, in Ontario to Minnesota, and all the way south to Georgia, Indiana, and Ohio, and Iowa. It's it is an open spreading shrub. Sometimes they call them a small tree and it grows 15 to 25 feet tall. It's particularly noted for its reddish brown hairs that cover all the young branches. And, um, you know, some, it's, it's kind of the same way that velvet covers the horns of uh, deer. That's why it's called the name, staghorn, you know, sumac. It, it also has these beautiful ornamental fruit clusters and an excellent, excellent, excellent fall color. It has long or large, 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 large uh, compound Odd pennate leaves. They're each they're each like twenty four inches, you know, long and wide, and um, they're bright green uh, during the growing season, and um, smooth and glaucous underneath. And then the leaves turn these beautiful shades of yellow, orange, and and red in autumn. Uh, each leaf has thirteen to twenty seven leaflets on it, and they're usually about two and to five inches long. And then the tiny yellow, tiny yellowish greenish flowers bloom on this terminal cone-shaped panicle in late spring, and then also it's June into July. And they they have male and female flower cones, and they're usually on separate plants, so dioecious. And then they produce they produce these beautiful showy showy fruiting clusters. And they're about eight inches long, and each cluster contains. Um, berry-like droops, which ripen bright red in autumn. And then they gradually turn dark red and they stay persistent on the plant. The fruit attracts wildlife. And here's a, here's a, a photo, a, a, a distant shot of what the fruit looks like. And then showing, look at the fall color on, on, that's just starting on the plant that's in the, uh, the upper um, left-hand side. And then here's a close-up of um, that, that flower spike with the brag. 
Okay. And then this is another an, another another cultivar. You can see the color on the um, on the uh oh went too far. Look at the fall color on this. You know this the the, the stagger starts with that orange the yellow 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 down at the bottom and then goes to that bright bright orangey red. Incredible. You can see these along the the, the highways when you're driving. They just they, they they just show up like a sore sore thumb. And then this is the cut leaf version. Excellent ornamental for texture in the garden. It doesn't get as big, you know, it maxes out probably five feet tall and about seven feet wide. And then that's what the close up of the foliage, the cut foliage looks like. And then there's uh, these two cultivars there's the dissecta, the, the Stagrosoma dissecta. That's what, that's what it looks like. The, the, the photo up on the upper. Um, left hand side that's what it looks like in fall color and then down below is one called tiger eyes and it's one of you know it, it's it's a beautiful a beautiful ornamental you know in in the garden and then it it also turns it turns to um like a reddish you know copper red color in the in, in the fall this is tiger eyes in the growing season kind of a limey kind of a limey yellow color and, and so it really pops up and just really looks nice. And it works in, it works in part shade or, or full sun. This is, this is the winged sumac. This is, um, you know, it, it's called the winged or the smooth sumac. It has yellow, yellow whitish flower clusters in the summer, much later than the, than, than the, the, other, the other sumacs. And all sumacs tolerate really incredibly poor soils. And, and then again, great fall color. You can tell it's gonna be a beautiful, you know, um, yellow based uh, kind of orangey fall color when you look at the, the flower colors. And this one's hardier. This one's hardy to um, zone four. Shrub roses. This is a double knockout and not all roses are really finicky, high maintenance plants. So the modern shrub roses offer just blooms all summer long. And you know, and you know, and 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 also into into autumn, they're disease resistant. Uh, the, the knockouts are very disease resistant. The flower color differs by the variety, and but you most commonly see the shrub roses in shades of pink, red, whites, and yellows. Full sun, moist, well-drained soil. Um, and the, the, this will get up to six feet, and uh, and as wide as five feet. You know, and zones three to nine depending on which type you go with. This is a double knockout. And then the Ragosa roses are also spectacular. Uh, the one that is one of my favorites and it's on our fence line here. This is Hansa or Hansa, which is that double hot pink. And Alba is the white one, the single white one over on the, on the left side. And what's great is these are very, very, very drought resistant, exceptionally disease resistant and nonstop bloomers, nonstop bloomers. From the minute they start, the end of June, all the way until you know the end of um, uh, of the growing season. This is an, an, another one of the single pink ones. Here you go. That this is Hansa. You can see the double flowers. These are the fruits they form, and they're called rose hips. And so we usually encourage people to leave them on. And it's a neat, neat source, a great source of vitamin C for all the wildlife. So you leave them on the plant, don't, don't keep deadheading starting in uh, September, let the, let the fruit form, and then the birds will actually wait till they soften from all the freezing and thawing over winter and then gobble, gobble them up. That's usually in, in uh, the end of February, going into, into March. Oh, I'm doing just right on time, everybody. This is great. And then one of my all time favorites is, um, it, just because it's such a, a it, it's such a useful plant, uh, you may have heard of elderberry wine uh, or sambucus in elderberry, is a great um, uh, immune enhancer, and again used by Native Americans and used by us a lot. And the flowers are, are form in the summer, and you know mine is still in bloom right now. So it starts in in mid June, stays in bloom until all the fruit is set. And, uh, and, and, and this one actually is a photo of the black elderberry because the, the, see how nearly black the foliage is. And then this takes 
full sun or it tolerates part shade too. And it's hardy to zone three. Um, this is what it looks like. This is across my neighbor's yard. And I have one growing, you know, growing there. And, there, and there's one growing in my, in my garden too. This is a close up of the flower. You can see the, the panicle. And then this is what the fruit turns into. And you get these beautiful kind of, they start red and then they turn this kind of a, a, you, know, a, 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 you know, a cherry black color. And this is when it's good to make, uh, to harvest them and make elderberry jam or, um, you know, or elderberry wine, really fun. Okay, oh, spireas, spireas, this is gold flame. They're easily grown in average medium moisture and well-drained soils. Um, and, and they need to have full, full sun. They can tolerate half day shade. So, so uh, and then it, 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 it actually tolerates a really wide range of soils, but it, it really prefers rich and moist loams. Okay, so you wanna move the faded flowers, you know, and, you know, as practical. And, you know, light shearing is an option. You know, and it can, that encourages additional bloom. It flowers on new wood, so you know, prune it in late, late winter uh, to early spring if needed, so that you don't prune off too much. Okay, and they usually they say that you want to prune it um, after it finishes flowering, and they can be really aggressive because they self seed, and many have escaped gardens and naturalized in many parts of the eastern U.S. So be careful with this one. And then they'll also spread in the garden by suckering. Okay, this one is, um, oh, I had it. This is Anthony Waterer. Beautiful, 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 um, kind of a hot pink color. And okay, it says there's a good reason spires is a common site in the city planting at restaurants and even gas stations. It's a no winter to, to grow. The spire is beautiful in late spring to midsummer. It produces clusters of raspberry rose flowers. And many varieties, such as gold melon, uh, also offer attractive golden or lime green foliage. So growing conditions, full sun, to part shade in moist, well-drained soil, four feet tall, and um, zones four to seven. And then here's this, another picture of Anthony, Anthony Water. Beautiful masses of dark, uh, dark pink to crimson red. And this one's, this one's called Gold Mound. Okay, why didn't I do that? Okay, now Swamp Azaleas, uh, this is Rhododendron viscosum. And there are thousands of great hybrid deciduous shrubs floating around the market. It's tough to meet some of the late blooming North American varieties, the natives, okay. And Swamp Azalea is a superb plant that grows from Texas to Maine and um, just about everywhere in between. So flower colors can range again from white to pale pink to into yellow. And just a single plant in bloom will fill an entire garden with those sweet fragrance. Beautiful, beautiful. And then and when you plant them in mass, uh, it, it has a really fine texture and the flower display is just exquisite. And, you know, and it has super and red fall foliage. So it makes this, um, this shrub just absolutely amazing, absolutely amazing. Okay, planted in mass, it's fine texture, flower display and super red fall foliage make this shrub truly amazing. And some azaleas is not a preferred salad bar item for deer, but if hungry enough, they will munch on it. Ah, rats, I don't wanna hear that. Okay, here we go. Now, I was looking at this and um, thinking whether I should have added this or not. I love this shrub, and but this is one that took a huge hit. This is the Summer Snowflake Viburnum, and it's a cousin of the, um, the double file viburnum. And the reason they call it a double file viburnum is because the flowers are held up on either side of the stem and in all along the branch and you have them two ranked. So that's why I call it double file viburnum. 
most of the straight species variety blooms um, in the spring and it's a huge show. They look like dogwoods when they're in bloom, but this cultivar has a big show in, at the end of May. And then, then these flowers keep blooming all the rest of the way. This was my personal one until it froze to death when we had that, um, that Arctic blast uh, two years ago in, in February. I had five of these shrubs in my backyard. Every one of them was killed from the top to the bottom, roots included. But I didn't realize how, how touchy it was. That was a, a Minneapolis, you know, winter. But um, but here here it is, you know, here it is, you know, in full sun. I had mine planted in shade, so they they were much lighter, you know, lighter, less flowers. Um, this is Kingwood Center over in uh, Ohio. All of those, the whole driveway was lined with um, with with those. Um, summer snowflakes. This is what it looks like in fall. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. And then starting the fall color. And then this is what it's, this is what it looks like total fall color. Incredible. Crimson, 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 crimson red. Okay. And then last but not least, yucca. And some people love this and, um, and some people don't. Um, I have one in my garden that I've tried to get rid of for years. And it just keeps coming back and coming back and coming back. So I've just given up. I've said, okay, you can live here. And uh, they flower in summer. They have, they, the flowers are edible. And um, they, they're, 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 it's a clump forming, forming plant and, um, and very, very cold hardy down to zone five. And then, but it does need to be in full, full sun. But you have the spiky foliage. So it looks very, very tropical. Looks very, very tropical. And then these flowers are edible. You know, they, they are edible. But um, but I have to share a funny story. Uh, Mike Durer, the, the gentleman I learned woody plants from, did not like yuccas at all. And so when you have his textbook, you read it and he goes, he goes, yucca. What more can you say? Yuck. Ah. Oh. And so he hated them. But a lot of people love them and they, they're, they're very good and they're great for pollinators. They're great for pollinators. And I'm right at 10 minutes till, and I'm gonna end with just a bonus kind of a joke. This is a bottle shrub, joke, joke, yuck, yuck, yuck. And this one, provide, it provides unique color through all the seasons. It is wonderfully adaptable to sun or shade, and it grows in every hardiness zone there is. So, so, and it's a neat way to, to, to save your, 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 your blue bottles. So I thought I'd end with kind of a joke. Uh, let me go back to the Q and A. And I'll, I'll stop sharing the screen and we'll go to the, you go to the question and answer. Here we are. And then questions and answers are the questions. I'm gonna give the answers. Okay, so here's Barbara and I think it's Carastus. I've been trying to do less cutting back of my plantings in order to provide food for wildlife during the winter months. That's very good, that's very good. Should dieback shrubs be cut back in fall or can they be left to springtime before cutting back? Man, Barbara, that is a fantastic question. And um, I, I saw my favorite guy, Joe Boggs, Dr. Joe Boggs from, um, from um, Ohio State University gave a presentation at the very end of the, I want to know, he was the first yesterday uh, at, during the perennial plant symposium. And he gave the best advice on, uh, there are so many of the pollinating bees, the little small bees that are stem um, borers. They, they lay their eggs in empty stems that um, on, on plants or they bore into the stem. So if you can leave them up, until we get into warmer, um, you know, you know, um, season, and when the eggs would have hatched, and those little, those little beneficial bees have moved on in the world, that's a better way to do it. It's great, great question, great big question. Okay, and then here's anonymous attendee. Are there any thornless shrub roses? Yes, there are thornless shrub roses, and um, it is called. The best one is called. Oh man, it was right on my tongue. It's, um, it'll come to me. Uh, don't shrub roses need constant net heading to look their best? No, they do not. Knockout roses just keep blooming like crazy. Any of the Ragosa roses keep blooming like crazy. They do not need to be deadheaded. So they just keep growing and growing at large shrub size. 
you don't have to you don't have to mess with them so great great question and then anonymous attendee again i need some rabbit resisting you need some rabbit resistant perennial recommendations sun and shade wow anonymous attendee why don't you send me an email my email address is jennifer b j-e-n-n-i-f-e-r-b for brennan at chalenursery.com and i have a handout that I'll send you that has uh, the, the rabbit resistant um, perennials. Okay. And that my address is Jennifer B. And that's two N's, J E N N I F E R B at shallynursery.com. So, um, hey, this was great. And we're five minutes to go. And I don't see any more questions with just these three. And a wonderful presentation. Thank you, thank you so much. I'm glad you enjoyed the photos. Um, I, I, that's, that's really nice, thank you so much. Thank you everybody. And uh, tune in next week for ideas for fall color in your garden. And it's not just gonna be trees and shrubs. I'm gonna give you some really cool ideas that you can add even now and, and to enhance how your garden will look going into the off season. All right. Thank you so much. Hi, Usha, and uh, enjoyed it. Thank you. All right. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and sign off. And remember, everybody, these are recorded and um, they're posted in YouTube, uh, usually um, Friday uh, at, at the close of business. So you can watch them over the weekend. So, okay, very good. We have another chat. Oh, here we go. Oh, here's Mike McKeenan. What can I feed my rose rugosa to make it bloom more? Oh, great question. I'm glad I didn't sign off. Uh, Mike, you want to get the uh, Dr. Earth um, Bud and Bloom Booster fertilizer. And it has a 493 uh, recommendation, or I mean, a nutrient evaluation. And it lasts two months, 60 days. And it's one cup on the ground for every 10 square feet. So most rugosas can get pretty big. So I would plan to put two cups underneath them all underneath and just leave it, you know, water it in one day, spread the fertilizer, even on top of mulch, because it'll break down and go through the mulch. So, but it's just a Dr. Earth bud and bloom booster. Okay. All right, I'm glad I didn't sign up. I'll, I'll give it three more minutes just to make sure I get all of the, um, all of the questions that you're um, that you're having, and I just noticed another chat. I'm going to open up both the chat and the question and answer one. Oh, got to move the Q and A. Hold on, isn't this so funny? Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. There. All right. Oops. Oh, the, oh, the oh, this is the Q and A. Oh no, that's that's. Uh, thank you for the thank yous. I'm gonna do this minimized again. There we go. Okay. Everybody enjoy this nice weather we're having. This is so nice. Can you share your email one more time? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. It is Jennifer B. So J-E-N-N-I-F-E-R-B. My last name is Brennan. So it's my first name, my last initial at Chalet Nursery, C-H-A-L-E-T-N-U-R-S-E-R-Y dot com. All right, I'll watch for those, everybody. And um, Donna Leibovitz said, wonderful presentation, thank you. Thank you so much. It is just now 10.59, and I'm, I'm gonna check to see if there's, I've got all the questions answered, and we're good, we're good, we're good. Uh, and Mike says, thank you. All right, everybody. Thank you so much. Thanks for tuning in and be sure and watch the YouTubes. All right. Thanks. Bye now.